Hello and good morrow, dear friends. I am Daisy Victoria, and I have been in dire need of a rough to complete this project. So today, I am going to take you with me as I make it. Throughout this very rough project, I have indulged myself in rough puns, such as, rough day today, things are looking a little rough. If you, dear friend, also have a clever rough pun, please share it with me. This project was inspired by the masterful paintings of Henrik Averkamp, who created wonderful images of frozen over Dutch towns in which the townsfolk are skating upon the frozen over streets. These paintings were masterfully created around the turn of the 16th to 17th century. Roughs such as this one can be found in the entire region in this period. They are also popular in Elizabethan England. I actually started this dress about three years ago. And in fact, I constructed the entire gown, except for the ruff and also the red strips that go in the hair for some reason. Digging out this project and finally making that ruff was so awesome. And it felt really good to accomplish this unfinished project. So the ruff is like this big piece of linen and it's, um, really wrinkled. It looks like I did hem one edge. That edge is actually hemmed by hand, so I did a lot of work on that. And it looks like I did a great job of making sure that I actually pulled a thread out so that, you know, each edge is cut exactly along a thread, so that's really good. I, it looks like I really wanted to do a good job on this, and it also looks like ironing is in my future. Also in my bag, I have a spool of white thread, which I obviously was using to sew it, and some rice starch, which I know I intended to use to starch my ruff. Alright guys, let's make a ruff. These are my fabric pieces for the ruff. I have three completely full widths of fabric here which means that my ruff is going to be very voluminous. I've also cut out the neckband. This is wide enough to go around my neck and then fold in the edges. And then to make it, I folded it into the center and then fold it again. So it's actually four times thickness. Now to join the pieces of ruff together, I'm actually stitching them so that they just match up as you can see here. It's important to do this so that they don't overlap because if they were to overlap that would provide extra bulk at those join pieces in the rough. So if you join them this way then you have a nice even width of fabric all the way throughout your rough. This method is also described in some instructions that I found helpful. They are written by Noel Gillicam, who moderates the Elizabethan costume group over on the Book of Face. And be sure to check that out if you want. Uh, furthermore, you can find some really great insight into rough making in Janet Arnold, as well as some in the Tudor Taylor. Once those pieces are joined, it's time to hem them together. Now, remember I did already hem most of my ruff, but I'm just kind of cleaning it up here around the joined areas because I did actually rejoin them after I got the ruff out. Next, it is time to gather. So this really needs to be done by hand. Um, I don't know if you can try to get away with it by machine. I was not willing to risk it. I have been advised that by hand is the best way to go. Now you need at least two rows of running stitches for the gathers. You can do more. There are roughs from period that have more. I am far too lazy to be bothered to do more than two on this one. So I am doing two and I'm sewing it through with two different needles. Each needle is attached to a thread which is actually still attached to the spool of thread. So I'm just pulling that all the way through and I just do it like a little section at a time. And you can see here I'm <laughs> kind of pulling the thread through because it's you know still attached to the cone threads but it's a very long piece of rough fabric here. <laughs> Once I have that all pulled through the rough, I'm going to actually gather it up. 
So the goal of this is for the ruff to fit onto the neck band. Now you'll want to just kind of keep pulling on those threads and gather, gather, gather for a long time until it is the correct size. When I'm gathering something so very large, I do like to pull the gathering threads from both sides of my very long piece of fabric, which is what I am doing here. It is advised that you do not cut off the threads until you are actually done attaching the ruff to your neckband, and that is so that you can do any final adjustments that are needed later. I divided my neckband into three sections, and that's because I thought it would be really easy to match up the three sections of my ruff because they are three widths of fabric, so three sections. Super logical here. You can see here I'm matching the pin which marks one third of the neckband to that section on the ruff, and these are going to be my guiding points. So when you attach the ruff to the neckband, naturally you want those to be matching so I actually sewed those in sections so I sewed like one section then another section and then another section stitching the rough onto the neckband took a lot of time and a lot of patience because it requires each one of those gathering stitches to actually be attached onto the neckband this was definitely a lengthy process and I think it's well worth taking the time to do it really well. Even though you are seeing this very quickly, it kind of feels like I've been sewing this forever in real life. So the point at which I finally get to sew down the other side of the neckband is actually quite refreshing. To sew down the other side, I simply folded it over so that now it's kind of sandwiching that rough. And once again, I have those three sections marked with pins. So I matched those up and then I attached it exactly the same way I attached the other side. So just making sure that I catch every single little gathered pleat of fabric and sew it onto the neckband. Finally, once I've got the entire rough stitched onto the neckband, it's time to close up the ends of the neckband 
So here I'm actually just doing a pretty simple whip stitch so that the ends are closed together. All right, it's looking really good. Next, I'm going to attach something so that I can actually tie my ruff on. I created these finger loop braided cords using a historical technique, and I'm just attaching them here so that I can tie my ruff closed around my neck. Another option is to use something like hooks and eyes. I like the ties because I can very slightly adjust how tightly my ruff is tied that way. All right, now we have a really fun part, which is dividing up the ends of the ruff so that I can actually form it into those nice little rough shapes. <laughs> so I'm basically trying to figure out where I'm going to have each one of them. So yeah, there's a lot here. <laughs> And what I'm doing is dividing it into equal sections. So I had three very easy sections because of the three sections of fabric. And then I divided those in half, so I had six, and then divided those in half, and so on. So I'm just continually dividing them in half until I'm finally pleased with whatever size the uh, little folds end up being in the end. This process takes a bit of time and a bit of patience but is actually not nearly as time consuming as some of the other parts of the rough making. Once I was pleased with the size of my little rough folds, I actually ran a thread through them all and that just helps to secure them because when you go to starch the rough, you want to make sure that they're actually staying where you want them to be. So this is basically a sort of a basting thread and I'm simply catching it on all of those places that I want to be sort of the middle of the rough. You can see that the thread is going through each spot that's like the middle of the rough points. So everywhere it kind of goes through the center, the thread is running through to connect them. And that's gonna be really nice to keep it in place so that I'll be able to set this rough the way that I want it. Speaking of setting the rough, I'm going to be using a curling wand. I actually didn't have a curling iron at all, so I bought it for this project. And I like the wand because it tapers in there at the end. Here's the starch and the rough hanging up. I'm using pure rice starch, neutral pH, so fancy. And I'm preparing it according to the instructions. The rough itself is actually wet before starching, so I have already dampened the rough and then I've hung it up there. And I am mixing the starch here on the stove so that I may heat it according to the instructions. And I'm just stirring it up there as I create it. So once I am ready with the starch, I'm gonna take this rough 
which is dampened with water, and just submerge it into the starch bath. So I'm gonna make sure that starch gets all over the roof and just kind of even, you know, make sure the whole thing has got a nice coat of starch. And I'm gonna get out any excess starch, again with make sure it's pretty even. After that's done, I am laying the rough out to dry here. So I'm kind of using my fingers to make those little rough folds go where I want them to because that's going to make it a lot easier to set the rough later because they'll already be at least somewhat in the direction that I want them to be. And when we have a complex project, we certainly like to make it as easy on ourselves as we possibly can. This is also something that Noel recommended you do, and I know that I would like to listen to that little tip because it looks much easier. So I'm taking my curling wand, and now I'm going to set the rough. So I'm just going to put the curling wand in there inside each and every little place where I need to set it. Ah, I'm smart. I'm getting this glove to protect my little fingers. Yeah, make sure you don't burn your fingers setting the rough. That would be really sad. This glove is really nice because it allows me to kind of hold and mold the rough pieces around that curling wand, so it helps me to set them. This process of setting the rough takes quite a bit of time, but that's okay. You know what? We're on a very time-consuming project, and that's cool because it's kind of fun to have that sometimes. I read that in period, roughs were considered to be very frivolous because in fact you are using rice starch, something that should be a food stuff, and you're using it for a luxurious, lavish fashion item, so it's quite scandalous. I am taking my time setting the rough. I did one layer like the top as I had laid it out and then I flipped the rough over and did the other layer after that. So now the top which was previously the bottom. In period there were certain poking sticks used to set roughs. We now have curling irons available which are already hot so we don't have to take a poking stick and stick it in the fire unless of course you want to. That would actually be super cool I think. Most curling irons are very bulky at the end so what I like about this curling wand is that it tapers at the end and there's no like sticky out pointy part on top of it like the clamp that many curling irons have so I think this works really well. My rough is looking pretty good while I do this, but I notice that it still is a little bit flatter than what I would like. So ultimately, I'm actually going to put the rough onto my mannequin and give it another good go of setting. Here on the mannequin, I'm just going to go back through with my curling wand and continue to set the rough until I like the way it looks. And notice that my basting thread that holds those rough folds in place is actually still there. I leave this basting thread in until the very end and after I'm pleased with the way the rough looks, only then do I remove the basting thread. Now one must note that when one washes the rough later, any sort of washing in water is going to remove your starch. So that basting thread is going to be important to put back in before you wash it if you like the way you set your rough and you'd like to reset it the same way again next time because that'll make it really easy. You can just set it the same way you had it if you have that guide in there. Here is my completed rough. I think it's so cool. I have never made one of these before, so I'm very excited to have my very first one. It's pretty big, actually, though it certainly is not the biggest rough that one might have in this period. 
So I'm actually excited to try some different ones. This is the full Dutch ice skater look, which the rough goes with. And I'm very excited to have the whole look coming together finally with this amazing rough. And here is some footage of me pretending to be a turn of the 17th century Dutch townswoman. If you felt inspired by following along with me and you make your own rough project, please feel free to tag me on the social medias and share photos with me because I would love to see it. And if you use Noel's instructions, I'm sure that he would love to see it too, so make sure you go to that Elizabethan costume group and share it with your tribe because we are all here so excited to see what you make. I will also be making a video in which I get dressed in the entire outfit, so if you're interested in seeing what all the layers are and how a Dutch townsperson might have dressed around the turn of the 16th to 17th century, I will be very glad to share it with you. I hope that you all have a fantastic day and good luck on all of your projects, be they roughs or anything else. <laughs> Bye-bye. Wonderful masterpieces of frozen over Dutch townsfolk, folk weren't frozen, the towns were frozen. Throughout this very rough project, I keep forgetting the word indulged. <laughs>